Haunting us for millennia, they hunt under the cloak of darkness. Hungry for the heat that beats within us, bloodsuckers drink the blood of the living and they eat the flesh of the dead. Millions for every mortal soul. Blood-sucking bugs have conquered almost every ecosystem on this earth, including us. I'm Phil DeVries, and I'm on the hunt for bugs that suck our blood and eat our flesh. I'm about to take you on a journey to the dark side of the bug world. It's a face-off with, with the biggest, most disgusting, and most lethal bugs in the world. And it's all leading up to the ultimate test. I'll go head to head with a blood-sucking bug that's the most dangerous animal on the planet. I'm about to make a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, to investigate the blood suckers, the flesh eaters, and the body snatchers. I offer my body. Blood. It's spilt throughout the animal kingdom in the brutal battle to survive. Claws, jaws, beaks and teeth rip through flesh to get to this rich vein of protein, a fountain of nourishment and strength. There are some creatures who only eat blood. Even bugs want a taste, and they've figured out a million different ways to get it. As an entomologist, blood-sucking bugs mesmerize me. But there's one big bloodsucker that looms large in everybody's imagination. A beast that embodies the terror of the night. Before I start searching for blood-sucking bugs, I thought it would be really wise to learn something about the legend of the true vampire. Bat. And I've come here to meet the beast behind the myth. Will it live up to its fierce reputation? This is batologist Kim Williams, director of the Bat Zone at the Cranbrook Institute of Science. And she's, well, crazy for vampire bats. So why do they call them vampires? Step into my bat cave and we'll find out. Who could resist? I know, I know, it's not a bug. Nice art. <laughs> but it shares some blood-stealing habits with bugs, and I want to know more. Do you know how weird this is? I mean, I'm in a cramped little cage with bat sounds all over the place, filled with vampire bats. There are bowls of blood laying all over the place. And you're just sitting there like, oh. We're on a picnic. <laughs> this is awesome to me. <laughs> Kim has maintained a vampire bat colony here at the Institute for the last seven years. That looks suspiciously like, what is that? It's cow's blood. Cow's blood? Yep, you get it from a slaughterhouse. They really seem to like the, the cow's blood the best. Is it true that vampires live only on blood, nothing else? That's right, yep. They're obligatory blood feeders. They even don't really need water. They get everything that they need from the blood that they drink. So these are just uh, living, breathing bloodsuckers, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And like many insect bloodsuckers, they've perfected the sneak attack. She'll get up on her hind two feet, and you can see how her knees are, are bent like this. Mm -hmm. And she'll actually tiptoe over to the animal. As well as stealth, they've got other features in common with blood-sucking bugs. These animals are heat seekers. They've got built-in thermal sensors that locate the blood flowing closest to the surface. This is where their sharp teeth will slice. They keep the blood dribbling by using an anticoagulant, a chemical that prevents clotting. It's another trick bloodsuckers share as the thick liquid flows from their victim, they lick. 
taking in about two tablespoons per feed. I offered my blood to this night stalker. Can I get this thing to bite me? I've been stung by scorpions, mobbed by ants, and chased I'm by violent wasps. But this bat won't bite me. These are vegetarian vampires, aren't they? Oddly, these bats aren't interested in human blood. They're fed daily with cow's blood and don't want to taste my offering. In the wild, they do sometimes bite humans and can spread rabies. Vampire bats are the only mammal that live exclusively on blood, and their stealth and heat-seeking abilities have made them very successful at what they do. As well as the talents they share with vampire bats, bugs have taken the art of blood-sucking to an entirely different level. Like the vampire bats, many can use heat to sense their victims and use stealth to ambush and escape. But bugs have other sinister secrets. Some live on the source of blood itself. Their bodies expand, their jaws mince flesh, their beaks probe our skin, and pumps in their head force blood out of our veins. They inject us with dangerous chemicals and disease. Bugs are the heavyweights of the blood-sucking world. And one of the biggest and hungriest is the kissing bug. It creeps through the night, piercing through flesh to steal blood from sleeping victims. It's called the kissing bug because it prefers to feed from the soft skin at the lips. But it will dine anywhere blood flows to the surface. And its bloodthirsty habit can pass on a parasite that triggers a killer disease. Chagas. It can cause vomiting and fever before it submerges silently into the blood. It can haunt the body for decades, slowly weakening internal organs until they finally collapse. One of my heroes, the biologist Charles Darwin, was bitten by a kissing bug, and some believe he died of Chagas. Almost 18 million people in Central and South America are infected with Chagas a disease for which there is no vaccine and no cure. I'm traveling to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, where scientists work with some of the deadliest organisms in the world. I'm going to see science at the bleeding edge. In this lab, behind three layers of protective meshing, a group of researchers works to stop the kissing bug's carnage. I'm here at the CDC with Dr. Ellen Dotson, and right over there, there's a really interesting experiment going on. Dangerous pathogens can be part of the job. We need to see before we go in and see this experiment. Ebola, smallpox, anthrax. At the CDC, teams work with the most lethal contagions. Well. Ellen's group is developing a weapon that may save thousands of lives. They're working with genetically engineered bacteria. How do I look? Paranoid? Slightly. All right, let's go in there. All right. This imitation hut is teeming with kissing bugs. There are lots of bugs in here. There are probably two or three hundred bugs in here. They are designed to hide. Their thin, flat bodies squeeze to conceal in cracks and crevices of the hut. I'm here to watch their blood-sucking strength and discover what makes them so deadly. Oh, here's one. This is one big bloodsucker. So, this adult, that's a... Uh, that's a... That's a fairly big blood sucker, isn't it? Yeah, they can take it's almost 200 microliters of blood. It's like twice, three, four times its body weight? About three times its body weight. So they're, they're going to be crawling all over me now. Um, 
Are they in my suit at all? More and more are crawling from every crack and dropping from the ceiling okay, onto me. Here. You know, I'm getting a little creeped out. Is there, can we talk about this outside the hut here? Right here is a feeding station, a latex membrane filled with blood and heated to body temperature. Here, I can watch exactly how they feed and how they transmit disease. They pierce the surface with their beak-like mouth, pistons in their head, creating a vacuum that pumps blood into their stomach at high speed. I can't help but notice these things literally blow up like a balloon. Feeding triggers their stomach to expand, swelling to take in up to three times their own body weight. But it's what they do after they eat that spreads disease. It defecates. Its feces is infected with the parasite. Scratched into the wound, these parasites cause chagas. Ellen's team is working on a cutting edge cure. We have introduced genetically engineered bacteria in these bugs. A bacteria designed to kill the Chagas parasite within the bug's gut. We will produce a population of bugs that could feed on humans, but they cannot transmit the disease. If it works, these beneficial bacteria will multiply and spread throughout the kissing bug population. Someday, these bugs may spread the cure instead of the disease. The fear of this bug's kiss is dwarfed by a tiny insect that doesn't just live among us. This bloodsucker lives on us. It's an all-out assault by the nastiest bloodsucker on your body. These bugs attack in armies, swarming our skin, teeming through our hair. They are born here, their eggs glued to our scalp. And when they emerge, they will consume us, piercing through our skin to guzzle our blood, the only source of nutrition they will ever need. Generation after generation, lice have made us their home. And some kinds of lice can kill. During World War I, body lice spread typhus, which killed over three million people. Another kind of louse, the head louse, doesn't spread disease, but it can make your life a misery. I'm here at the University of Massachusetts where they, in there, they got something called the lice lab. And you know, I'm just itching to get in there. I'm joining scientist John Clark, who's at the head of a project to try and combat these prickly parasites. My understanding is that, you know, lice aren't really a problem, are they? In the, the statistics that I see recently, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2.6 million households in the United States that have a child or themselves infested with, with head lice. Well, that's a happy little statistic. The head louse is a choosy little cootie. It can only survive on a human scale which makes it uh, difficult to study. So in order to avoid their own heads being infested, these scientists came up with an idea that was head and shoulders above the rest. The world famous artificial scalp. So here I am with Kyung Sook Yong, one of the major inventive forces behind the artificial scalp. So can you, uh, can you show me how this works? Okay. First, a stirring bar is placed in a little cup. This will keep the blood liquid. Next, add real human blood, kindly donated by the Red Cross. A thin membrane is stretched okay. carefully over the top of this Almost tube. Flawless. It's and a good mimic of human skin. Word. Then, yeah. the tube is turned upside down and placed on top of the blood. Finally, 
our last ingredient, a tuft of human hair, lightly sprinkled with lice. Here they feast on an easy meal. From a Laosite view, it's the same as being on a human victim, hair to hold, blood to drink. Now you can really investigate them. Human lice evolved over thousands of years to be able to hold tightly onto our hair. Their claws act like tiny grappling hooks designed to scale our locks with the ease of a gymnast. And they've split into three separate species, each adapted to one place on the human body. Head, body, pubic. Head lice are thin to navigate the tightly packed hairs on our scalp. Each of the six legs fitted with tiny claws to grab the thin, smooth textured head hair. Pubic lice are fatter and have bigger claws, more suitable for the coarse texture of pubic hair. So John, you got three kinds of lice. You got head, body, and, and pubic lice. I mean, how do they differ? I mean, how do you tell them apart? They've adapted themselves to different parts of your body in terms of how well they can grasp certain types of hair. And to prove it, we decided to run a little experiment. If we could get some of your body hair, we could probably run this experiment right here and we'll have a little louse race. So what do you need? Well, why don't we start with probably a, a head hair. One from the head, one from the body, and yeah, well, for this other one, this other hair a little further down south, uh, I need a little privacy, OK? Hey, get lost. To see how the head louse is best adapted to the head hair, we place one on each of the various strands. Louse number one settles on a head hair. Head louse number two on the body hair. And finally, on the pubic hair, head louse number three. Again, ladies and gentlemen, one kind of louse, three kinds of hair. Tension is high. Which kind of hair will the head lice race up the fastest? Gentlemen, so get ready to start your head lice. Ready, set, go. And they're off. The lice on the head and body hairs neck and neck as they pull out of the starting block. Yeah, no, the head hair is coming on. <laughs> the pubic hair is off to a slow start, but not giving up. Oh, yeah. Body hair seems to be in trouble. Body hair is going nowhere. Were his claws just not adapted to the body hair he's climbing? Go. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Pubic hair oh, no. is falling pubic behind. Pubic struggling, struggling. Body hair. Uh, and now the pubic hair pulling up the rear, so to say. And the head louse on the head hair? He's racing. He's racing. Oh, yes. He's pulling ahead. We have a winner. Well, Phil, as you notice, that the, the head louse seemed to do the best on the head hair. That was followed closely by the head louse on the body hair. And last but not least was the head louse on the pubic hair. Just goes to show you, it's all about location, location, location. Tiny organisms are often so finely tuned to their hosts that if they're placed in the wrong spot, they don't thrive. But give them the right piece of real estate, and you can't evict them. This is nothing compared to the next nightmare. What I'm about to see goes beyond bloodthirst. A bug that burrows into our flesh. Some maggots devour the dead. Others will only eat fresh meat. And one can show up in some disturbing places. After a trip to Costa Rica, Michelle Eskenaski began experiencing mysterious symptoms. Well, my legs started to itch, and I thought, oh, I'd gotten a bite. But it became progressively worse, where it was um, keeping me awake at night, and I thought, well, maybe I had poison ivy. One doctor thought it might be Lyme disease. 
another an infected cyst. And then I started to feel that there was something moving in my leg. A third expert implied it was all in her mind. And he looked at me and pointed to his head like I was crazy to think there was something moving in my leg. Antibiotics failed to help. A biopsy revealed nothing. I finally got found a dermatologist. When I went to see her, she looked at it and was completely baffled. Dr. Meryl Skelsey was on the case. She did not feel well. She had some headaches. I had these terrible, sharp pains. She felt tired. She felt weak, lethargic. I'm having to get up and change pajamas in the middle of the night because this thing is oozing everywhere. Then she stumbled across the answer, something so bizarre she could hardly believe it. It fit all the symptoms that I had and explained that there was paralyzing pain, that you could feel something moving at the site, and that there was oozing. A book described the invasion of a body by a maggot. Maggots, the larvae of flies, are eating machines. Hooks in their front haul them through flesh. They breathe through their backside so they can dive headfirst into their food. Michelle picked up her maggot in Costa Rica, one place where the human bot fly lives. The adult female hijacks the body of another insect and lays her eggs on its belly. The fly will transfer the eggs to the next animal it lands on. Body heat causes the eggs to hatch into maggots that burrow swiftly into flesh. Incubating inside our bodies for months. Finally erupting alive. They invade squirrels, cattle, monkeys, even humans. I went the next day to have it taken out. I wasn't living with this one more day. And I anesthetized her first. And we actually, I actually had to make an incision with a scalpel in order for this larva to come out. She started pulling out small, slimy, worm-like looking things. And she stopped and gasped. And I thought, well, what is in there? I told her, look, here it is. It's coming out. And I, then I was totally mortified. I think we both screamed at the same time. These invaders spend months inside growing plump off live flesh. They squat obstinately inside their host, spikes on their back puncturing through tissue, hooks anchoring them, making removal a nightmare. And this is what the doctor pulled out of Michelle's leg. Oh, God much bigger than I expected. I expected it to be about this big, and it turned out to be this big. I was really surprised. Of all the dermatologic conditions I've seen, this was definitely the most, one of the most disturbing. They can even invade the soft tissue around the eye. These bugs make the flesh crawl, but in an odd twist, medicinal maggots are being used by hospitals as the world's smallest surgeons. Some people have a natural aversion to creepy crawlies. Sometimes they thought they were actually, not just on your body, but actually eating parts of your body. They are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Nurse Mary Jones is a firm advocate of maggot therapy. It's nature. And nature is very simple and very, very effective. Alan Hughes, a double amputee, is one of the thousands whose wounds are being healed by flesh-eating maggots. These maggots eat only dead and decaying flesh and allow the rest of the tissue to heal. It's much improved from last week. It's cleaning up nicely, and the other edges of the wound are beginning to contract it. <gasps> Look at it now, that's beautiful. It is, to me that's looking beautiful. Today, approximately 300 tiny maggots are placed in his open wound. 
Over the next few days, they will continue to devour the infected tissue and grow fat. Maggots have been healing for centuries. In the United States, doctors first noticed the benefits of maggots during the Civil War. Soldiers with wounds infested by maggots healed faster. Once antibiotics were discovered, maggots were all but forgotten. With the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, maggots have once again become valuable in the fight against infection. Their tiny mouth parts are perfect tools to snip away dead tissue with incredible accuracy. And their saliva seems to disinfect the wound, promoting healing. Within three days of Mary's treatment, and my wound started healing. The maggot's hunger has Alan on the road to recovery. And when it was what it is, it's unbelievable. Maggots, revolting as they look, can be a powerful tool in medicine to change lives. And they're not the only bug used in biotherapy. One of the all-time nastiest bloodsuckers is also making waves in the medical world. And I want to find it where it lurks, in the dank places of the earth. A bloodsucker whose jaws can mince flesh. Bloodsuckers are everywhere, even in there. You know, most people in this swamp, they worry about gators and cottonmouths. But you know, bloodsuckers far outnumber the predators in this swamp. I'm on the lookout for the slimiest bloodsucker. Me? I'm thinking a lot about leeches. These worms trouble the lakes and pools of every continent, from the icy waters of the Antarctic to the swamps of the Amazon. Rumor has it that this bayou is crawling with leeches. There's only one way to find out. Got to give them a little skin. <sighs> From the depths, leeches sense their prey by smell and by sensing vibrations in the water. My submerged foot has disturbed the dark water. Alert and hungry, they home in on me. Their bite is silent. Anesthetics in their saliva stifling my defense response. If a leech does bite, I won't know until I look. It's time to check my fishing line. That, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is a leech. And you know, it's not gonna let go until it's full of Bill's blood. So one of the interesting things about leeches is that this animal has circular saw-like jaws that it cuts tissue with to start a wound and then starts using a tremendous amount of suction to pull the blood out of my system. With over 300 microscopic teeth, leeches grind through flesh. I can't really feel when it's biting, but I can every once in a while when it starts sucking. As they suck, their bodies are designed to expand, making them a bag of blood. That's a blob only a mother could love, huh? I've given enough for the day. There are a couple of ways that I can get rid of this. 
Method number one. Obviously, the, the leech can detect heat, and it, it doesn't like it, but look at that. It doesn't like that at all, but it, it's not letting go. It's not going to let go because it's firmly embedded in my flesh, sucking my blood. So I think we'll have to try another method. Never go into the swamp without a little bit of salt. Its bloodthirst is so strong, it stays clamped down, despite the burning salt. You can see that even though that leech hates that salt, it loves my blood even more. But a second dose is too much. Oh, wow. There's a little bit of blood weeping out of the wound here. And that's because the saliva of a leech has a powerful anticoagulant. It's that anticoagulant in its saliva that makes it very interesting to the medical profession. In medieval times, the practice of bloodletting was believed to balance the body's humors. More recently, the leech is being used in reconstructive surgery. With all the advance in modern medicine, we still sometimes rely on these primitive creatures to finish the job for us. Dr. Cameron Kubehi has been using leeches for the last few years. The mainly we use the leech to be able to put this weird uh, limbs, finger, ear, put back on. It's their ability to keep the blood flowing that helps doctors reattach severed limbs and keep tissue alive. The leech is used as a bridge, as it bind enough time the body forms its own blood vessel. The leech drains the blood that's trapped in the wound, giving the body a chance to recover. Even though this blood-sucking machine was sucking my blood, it's not so bad. And one day, you never know, you may have to have leechotherapy. Much as I love leeches, I'm happy these bloodsuckers aren't in my backyard. But there are potentially deadly bloodsuckers that have taken over my home. And right now, could be infesting yours. These are parasites that live in our homes. Meet the flea. Incredibly, this tiny little bug has a reputation as the strongest bloodsucker on the planet. I'd read about it, I'd heard about it, but I had to see this bizarre world for myself and travel to the flea circus. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, may I present the singularly sensational flea circus. Flea circuses have fascinated us for centuries. And for your entertainment tonight, with their mix of magic and mystery. Bold claims are made of the performers. Strong enough to flip a coin thousands of times their own weight. Sturdy enough to perform a high dive and survive. Hubert, if you would, please. One bounce, two bounce, three bounces. Oh, he's up there. Three, a triple, a twist, and he's into the water. Oh, my God. I want to know more about their strength. That is Bruno the trained flea. So that's amazing. You gotta show me how to do this. I'd be happy to show you, Philip, but there is a small price. Mm, what's that? It's small. Fleas don't ask for much. Just a little bit of blood. Once again, I bleed for you. I fed the flea. Now, time to find out what's really going on here. The secret to the flea circus is the ability to get a flea into a collar. Let me show you. Some people are skeptical of the idea that a real flea could be performing in a collar. I'm ready to wrangle this flea. It's the secret to taming this powerhouse for the circus. It's trickier than it looks, but I got it. To test its strength, we'll hitch it to a chariot. Gosh, look at that. Holy smoke. This is one tough little sucker, able to move more than a hundred times its own body weight. Muscles in their legs are powered by a special protein, Resolin, famous for its storage and sudden release of energy. It's this protein that propels their famous jump. Fleas used to fly. At least their ancestors did. Somewhere along the line, they lost that ability. 
rejigging their flying muscles to generate their powerful jump. Their jump is like a rocket launch, 150 G-forces hurling them toward their victim. Their ability to jump from rats to humans fueled the spread of the plague. Plague destroyed a third of the population of Europe in the Middle Ages. Pestilence flowing through rodents and spread by the flea's bite. When a plague carrier bites, a thick stew of infected blood is vomited back into the open wound. The flea will bite dozens of times, each time injecting more fatal bacteria. Incredibly, plague still kills, even today. Fleas are strong, but the one bloodsucker that really gets under my skin is the tick. It's the creepiest bug I know, and it's got a grip that's hard to shake. Now this little sucker is of the hang on forever category. And I'm gonna use her to show you guys that when a tick gets on you, it hangs on for dear life and it doesn't matter what you do. She just bit down. Um, I can just barely feel it. What'll be dramatic is to see it swell up like a grape. The leathery skin on this tick's body is dimpled with folds so that she can expand with blood. Ticks are more than just a disgusting nuisance. They are number two in the world for spreading disease. They transmit Lyme disease with its telltale rashes, paralysis, and deadly fevers. Ticks pass sickness directly from wildlife to us. The amazing thing about ticks is often you don't even know when they bite. This particular tick came from a lab, so she won't give me any diseases, but she will clamp on firmly. Tick mouth parts are designed to punch through the skin, get to the blood beneath, and hold on tight. Working like two saw blades side to side, it raises through the soft tissue. Because of the backward direction of its barbs, the tick is embedded firmly into the host. We're bonded for as long as she needs. I think now that she's uh, in place, um, she's not gonna go anywhere. I'll uh, get on with my day and see you later. My little friend and I have been uh, running errands and doing stuff and she looks like she's uh, just about ready to uh, pull out so I, I'm gonna get in the house and uh, help her along. She's full to bursting point with blood. She's increased her weight 10 times. That's like me waking up, having some breakfast, and by the time I get around after dinner, I weigh 1,500 pounds. That's a lot. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Tick removal. If you're a fan of heart, look away now. Oh. Ticks hold on tight to suck your blood and spread more disease than any other bug, except one. It's time to meet the most dangerous bug in the world and the deadliest animal on the planet. The vampire with the most lethal appetite has taken to the air. And I'm going face to face with millions of them. Here in the Florida Everglades, where they have one of the highest concentrations of mosquitoes in the world. 
Make no mistake, the most insatiable bloodsucker on the planet is the mosquito, responsible for more deaths than all wars combined. This little parasite is insatiable. Some think of the common mosquito as a harmless, though annoying guest at the backyard barbecue. But this minute bug is a global killer. Mosquitoes have the power to shatter armies and destroy populations. Malaria, yellow fever, dengue. The massacre continues today. Up to 9% of the human race will be infected with malaria this year. Millions will die. The Everglades is mosquito heaven. But for me, entering those mangroves is going to be a lot like hell. There is danger within this twisted forest. Beasts who lurk in the dim waters, stalking silently, ready to attack from below. And the air is thick with mosquitoes. I want to know what these suckers feel like when they're really hungry, and I've come to the right place. Biting, itching. Mosquitoes keep swooping in to land on my exposed flesh. Here, they're unlikely to carry any diseases, but their thirst seems unquenchable. It's that hot blood of mine. This tiny insect is one of our deadliest and oldest enemies. And she's on the hunt. It's the females that are the biters. Mothers whose maternal instincts drive their thirst. After mating, she needs blood to produce her eggs. She is, in effect, a blood-seeking missile. Her compound eyes sense motion in hundreds of directions, but she will zero in on a fixed point, me. Sensors on her antennae detect carbon dioxide, exhaled every time I breathe. As she gets closer, her thermal sensors become aware of the heat of my skin. She can tell precisely which part of my body is exposed. She knows exactly where to land. Her mouth parts tap my skin, sensing the blood flow below. She pierces the skin, seeking out the nutritious liquid that will make her able to lay eggs. This is the kiss that can deliver death. What can we do to squash this killer? We've declared war and lost. Dynamite, DDT. We failed to come up with a vaccine for malaria. And new diseases are emerging. West Nile is sending shock waves throughout the United States. In the battle against mosquitoes, scientists have come up with a few interesting innovations. Why not fight the enemy with its own kind? This is the larva of Toxorhynchites, one of the largest mosquitoes in the world. It's a species of mosquito that does not feed on blood. Amazingly, it feeds on other mosquitoes, or at least their larvae. Toxorhynchites larvae are spread in a mosquito-infested area, and soon they'll devour the larval bloodsuckers, keeping the population down. But this is an invention with more dramatic results. It favors an all-out massacre. This mechanism mimics human breath, luring mosquitoes to their death. This machine is an attempt to control mosquitoes. It produces carbon dioxide here, and when the mosquitoes come in, 
they're sucked up into this box and bagged. And as you can see, uh, it seems to be working just fine because there are really a lot of mosquitoes here. So let's see what we got in the bag. There are thousands of them here, drawn by the false promise of a blood meal. Want to see up close? Beautiful, isn't it? <sighs> These mosquitoes are doomed. None will ever lay eggs. It's the end of the line for them. But it's also the end of the line for me. This is very unpleasant. I mean, seriously very unpleasant. In fact, I'm itching to get out of here. It seems that no matter how many of these bugs are killed, swarms more are ready to attack. And it's time for me to retreat. It's been a wild ride. From bugs that only live on humans to swollen sacks of blood. Maggots that cure us to mosquitoes that kill us. These animals impact our lives in ways we never expect. Blood-sucking bugs are amazing, but are only a tiny fraction of the bug world. I'm bloodied, I'm bitten, but I am not beaten. I'm ready to take on more. Advancing armies, invading nasties. The more bizarre and unusual bugs, the better. Ah.